The Chinese script uses thousands of individual characters and is the oldest writing system still in use today. From the oracle bone inscriptions, dating back to at least 1200 BC, Chinese characters evolved through many forms until the emergence of regular script in 500 AD. Also known as Kai Shu, this form would stand the test of time and remain almost unchanged until the present day. But just 70 years ago, this ancient writing system would face the greatest crisis of its 3000 year history. And today, you'll hear the story of the time they nearly killed Chinese. In 1936, a famous Chinese writer said, if Chinese characters don't die, then China will die. Even though this was still 13 years before the language reforms of the 1950s, this kind of negative sentiment towards the archaic Chinese script had been building up for decades prior, and to understand why the people at the time would feel this way, we have to understand the political and economical situation that China was in. For the longest time, China was an economic superpower in Asia, and despite internal fighting and occasionally getting invaded, it was always a source of powerful influence. This culminated to the Qing Dynasty in 1644, which was both large in size and strong in political control. However, while the Industrial Revolution was taking off in Europe, China closed its borders and failed to modernize, which would lead to its downfall. In the century of humiliation, China was repeatedly sacked and bullied by the Western powers and even neighboring Japan, which had already modernized. Intellectuals at the time struggled to figure out the cause of China's problems, and they ended up putting the blame on two things. Confucianist culture and Chinese characters. The idea was that Chinese characters were so difficult to learn that they were holding back China from truly modernizing. The first hint of language reform began in 1892, when a book kicked off the movement for a phonetic alphabet, which was a time when people tried to fit Chinese into an alphabet's framework. Then in 1909, Lu Feikui was the first to propose a systematic simplification of Chinese characters. However, radicals like Lu Xun wanted to take it a step further and destroy characters completely. In an ironic expression of patriotism, they declared that the eradication of Chinese characters would be to save China. The May 4th movement in 1919 served as a catalyst for the first language reform movement in the 1920s by the then ruling Nationalist Party. And in 1935, the Ministry of Education published a list of simplified Chinese characters based on handwritten forms that were already in use, but conservatives rejected it. This was actually a bad idea. Then World War II broke out and everybody kind of forgot about language reform for a while. After Japan was defeated in 1945, the Nationalist Party went back to fighting the Communists. They lost and got kicked out of China, so they went to Taiwan in 1949. And now the Communist Party had control over all of China, and they immediately got back to work with language reform. And oh boy, this is where the drama begins. Just 10 days after the Communist Party took over, a private entity called the Chinese Written Language Reform Association was formed, headed by Wu Yuzhang. Yeah, remember this guy? If not, watch my video on Pinyin after this. As before, this group of linguists wanted to abandon Chinese characters and shift towards a Latin alphabet, but then Mao Zedong sent them a letter and was like, no, 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 no. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to simplify characters, and then we're going to create a new alphabet based on Chinese symbols, because national pride. But if the plan was to eventually shift towards this alphabet based on Chinese symbols, why didn't they just use Zhuyin, an alphabet based on Chinese symbols? Good question. I don't know either. Perhaps Zhang Bingling's ridiculous antics weren't very communist of it. <coughs> so anyways, the committee got to work, and by the fall of 1950, they had drafted an early list of simplified Chinese characters. But supposedly the peasants were demanding to learn how to read amidst the land reform movement, and the government was like, you guys are too slow. So they formed their own official government organization called the Chinese Written Language Reform Research Committee. They held their first meeting in 1952 and immediately started fighting harder than the South Korean parliament. At this point, there were two sides you could be on, team symbols or team Latinization. Both sides were campaigning hard to gain public support. So when they organized a conference for everybody to come together, talk it all out, and figure out which system was the best, they instead resorted to verbal abuse. The Latinization people were calling the symbols obsolete old goats, and the symbols were calling them traitors in return. Since nobody was willing to back down, they ended up splitting up and working on their own systems separately. A couple years later in 1955, it was time to turn in their homeworks, and a total of six systems were presented to Chairman Mao. One Latin system, one Cyrillic system, and four symbol-based systems. So how were they? 
Well, after taking a look, Mazadon said they were elitist and more disappointing than Jamie Oliver's fried rice. It's really good fun. And by the way, if you don't want to be a disappointment to your Cantonese parents, you should learn Mandarin. This is the sponsor plug, by the way. With the Cancer to Mandarin blueprint, you'll be able to leverage your Cantonese skills to jumpstart your Mandarin. Mandarin Chinese may be one of the most difficult languages for English speakers, but not for you. The copy and paste method in this program maps out all the similarities between Cantonese and Mandarin, so you'll be able to make the switch easily. So whenever you want to say bingo in Cantonese, switch it to she bingo mei sai wun becomes she hai mei shi wan. Even if you just know basic Cantonese, this course will give you a major advantage and save you precious time. Not only that, you will also be joining a community of language learners, just like yourself, where everyone is supportive and helps each other reach their language goals. Learning Mandarin will open the door to so many opportunities and a massive international community. And the Canto to Mandarin Blueprint is one of the only programs on the market designed specifically for Cantonese speakers. They're offering a free webinar where you'll learn all about the copy and paste method Method and how the Cantos of Mandarin Blueprint can help you learn to speak Mandarin in just a few weeks. Check out the free webinar in the description box down below and thank you Canto Mando for sponsoring this video. So, the committee. Six different alphabet systems and none of them received a passing grade. But Wu Zhang, this sneaky son of a gun, he took this opportunity to once again criticize the symbol-based systems and advocate for further development of a Latin alphabet. Surprisingly, it worked. And the committee suddenly shifted their focus towards creating a Latin system and abandoned symbols altogether. In the same year, the first rounds of character simplifications were also taking shape. There were two goals for character simplification. Reduce the number of strokes in characters and reduce the total number of characters in use. Since it was believed that six to 7,000 characters were commonly used, the end goal was to simplify half of them. By the end of the year, a list of 515 characters and 54 components were simplified. And what I mean with the components is that certain components were simplified whenever they showed up in a complex character that contained them. So in all, this meant that a total of 1,700 characters would have a simplified form. And to reduce the total number of characters, 1,050 variant forms of characters were eliminated from use. In October 1955, they had a big national conference where they presented their work, Wu Yuzhang gave a moving speech on why language reform was necessary, and they all patted themselves on the back for a job well done. The new simplified characters would go into effect the following year on New Year's Day 1956. And it was also at this conference where they abandoned the traditional vertical writing of Chinese for the western-styled horizontal writing. They finally realized that humans see better side to side than up and down. But this was not the end. You see, the committee still wanted to achieve total Latinization and kill off characters completely. And the first version of pinyin they introduced to the public was actually only half of the pinyin notation and writing system. It was only the notation part. The writing system was to be implemented later in the second five-year plan, except they ran into some PR issues. So it went a little something like this. Symbols-based systems actually had a lot of public support, and even Mao Zedong himself endorsed them. And when the committee suddenly shifted their focus towards a Latin system, that caused the public to become suspicious of Pinyin. So when some intellectuals came along and openly criticized Pinyin, the public flooded in their support. They got a hashtag on trending, and they tried to cancel Pinyin and the committee that created it. It got even worse in 1957, when for a brief time the government allowed people to openly criticize the government. Now, everybody jumped on the bandwagon of dissing the language reforms. It didn't matter if you had linguistics knowledge or not. Heck, you didn't even have to be educated. Your pizza guy, the ama and Bible study, your neighbor's chihuahua. All of a sudden, everybody was a language Bruh. expert and tweeting about how much the language reforms sucked. Except, they really didn't know anything about languages, so most people just ended up attacking the committee members. At first, the committee tried to patiently reason with them. Fuck you! It didn't work. So they got angry and started using their own tactics against them. Now both sides were busy publishing nasty articles about the opposition, and it was a complete media firestorm. But pretty soon, Mao Zedong realized that letting people criticize the government was probably not his brightest idea. So he put an end to that real quick. The committee got the last laugh though, because some of their opposition bashed the government a little too much, and they paid the price. Some lost their jobs, some became scapegoats, and others were even sent to prison. But when the government announced the next phase of language reforms, there was still strong opposition against it. And the committee? Well, they're all public relations experts at this point. 
After all, they've done nothing for the past year except attack media companies who oppose them. Wait a minute. They've done nothing for the last year except attack media companies who oppose them. <laughs> So towards the end of 1957, the government realized this and disbanded the Language Reform Committee and told them to stop all their work. Simplified characters were already in use at this point, and the partially finished pinyin system would become finalized and officially announced in the following year. So basically what you're saying is, Chinese characters got saved because a bunch of scholars were so busy fighting the media that the government got fed up and fired them? Yeah, basically. This could have been a 15 second video. But ad revenue. Well, the story doesn't quite end here, because in 1964, more characters were simplified for a total of 2,238 characters. Another round of simplification was attempted in 1977, but that received very strong opposition and was quickly retracted. The modern set of simplified characters used in mainland China and Singapore fall largely in line with the 1964 update. And what about Taiwan? Well, it's kind of funny because a lot of officials in the Nationalist Party were actually pro-language reform, and even Chiang Kai-shek himself was sympathetic towards character simplification. But after retreating to Taiwan, perhaps out of spite or as a political statement, they decided to strongly oppose any further simplifications or reforms in the Chinese language. So this is why mainland China uses simplified characters with pinyin as their annotation system, and Taiwan uses traditional characters with the older zhuyin as their annotation system. Alright, this video is getting quite long, so I'm going to bring it to a close. But there's still a lot of questions left unanswered. Like, how exactly were characters simplified? And did they achieve what they set out to do? All of that will be a topic for a future video. So I'll see you in the next one. 我们下次再见了